Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for making the time to join us. I know it is a busy week for a lot of families back to school. My name is Stacey Fox, and I'm really proud and honored to be the president and CEO at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to our 2024 Budget Primer Town Hall this evening. Each year, our brilliant research team examines the state's budget to offer thoughtful analysis and responsible solutions to address some of the systemic inequities faced by many Georgians. This is an event um, that allows us to share our findings and for you to ask questions directly to GBPI's Brain Trust, our analysts, who worked many days and probably a few late nights to put this publication together. And if you ordered a hard copy, it should be in your mailbox already. And if you'd like to order one, feel free to order one here. We'll drop the link in the chat. I am so grateful for this team for their hard work. And I'm excited for y'all to gain value in, valuable insight into what's in store for Georgia this fiscal year. As we often say, a budget is a moral document and what we fund is what we value. And the truth is that many of Georgia's systems are failing to meet the needs of communities. As we enter the new fiscal year, Georgia continues a disappointing trend of hoarding resources to build large cash reserves, rather than the un using the undesignated surplus to address long-standing needs related to healthcare access, public education, and economic mobility. And let's be clear, this is not a surplus. Unless you've actually met your fiscal obligations, you can't call the money in the bank a surplus. Georgia's overall state reserves going into fiscal year 2024 are expected to be above $16 billion. On its face, this may be, appear to be a strong fiscal position for the state, but these are public dollars. These are dollars that belong to Georgians that should be supporting the needs of Georgians, not withheld due to out of touch budgeting practices that are strangling resources and undermining economic stability. GBPI, our entire team is calling for a restructuring of Georgia's broken systems st to stabilize and strengthen our state and communities. We have the resources to create a more inclusive and equitable economy and society for Georgia. It's simply a matter of political will. Our hope is that this budget primer will help you, our partners and advocates and state leaders better understand the details of what's actually included in the governor's 2024 fiscal year budget, and that you will use our, our analyses to influence legislation and policy outcomes in favor of the poor and marginalized in Georgia, not just the most wealthy and powerful. It is this sort of evidence-based activism that will help to advance our vision, GBPI's vision, our whole state's vision of a fair and inclusive state where everyone can prosper. So with that said, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening, Crystal Munoz. Crystal serves as GBPI's immigration analyst, researching policies that impact Georgia's immigrant community and advocating for more inclusive policies. Crystal will introduce each of our speakers and cover any housekeeping items at, ahead of the presentation. In the meantime, let me do my job by asking you to consider donating to GBPI today. GBPI is a nonpartisan research and policy institute that works at the intersection of research and advocacy and relies on the support of our community to fund our brain trust and our communications and our outreach work, work that frankly no one else in the state is doing. The, we, the research that we produce is used to hold our state government accountable with the goal of informing state fiscal policy and public policy programs that support Georgians in every corner of our state. Your gift will help us continue to be an influential voice on budget and policy in Georgia and allow us to deliver the valuable and unique research and insights, just like the content we're gonna to cover tonight. So we're gonna drop the link in the chat and we hope that you'll consider making a donation. Thanks again, everyone, for making time to be here this evening. And Crystal, I'll pass the baton to you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Georgia Budget and Policy Institute's Primer Town Hall, covering the state's 2024 fiscal year budget. My name is Crystal Munoz. I'm the immigration analyst here at GBPI, and today I will serve as your moderator. You'll be hearing presentations from GBPI's analysts who produce the data and the research for the budget primer publication. But before we get started, I wanted to take a few minutes of your time 
As part of our efforts to improve our content and your experience, we'd appreciate if you fill out the evaluation form that will be emailed to you following this event. We'll also leave some space at the end of the presentation for you to ask questions directly to our analysts about the information we covered during this event. So if you have any questions at any point, please write them down and drop them and drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to get them all answered. Now, moving along to our main discussion, I will now introduce our speakers. Please welcome Danny Canso, Director of Legislative Strategies and Senior Fiscal Analyst who will be covering budget and revenue. We also have with us today, Ife Finch Floyd, the Director of Economic Justice who will be discussing DECAL and later in the presentation, Human Services. Next up, we have Dr. Stephen Owens covering K through 12, followed by Ashley Young, GBPI's Higher Education Analyst. Next is Leah Chan, Director of Health Justice. And last but not least, Ray Calfani, Senior Analyst for Worker Justice and Criminal Legal Systems, who will cover the Department of Labor and Georgia's Department of Corrections. And with that, um, Danny, can I pass it to you to get us started? Absolutely. Good evening, and thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, I am Danny Canso, uh, and, and we so much appreciate all of us, all of those joining us this evening. Um, and, and I think it's important to start by uh, looking at our revenue system, uh, which obviously, as Stacey uh, alluded to, has, has put us in an unprecedented situation where Georgia now uh, stands with uh, likely over $16 billion in cash on hand uh, between our revenue shortfall reserve and the much larger unobligated surplus account. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, uh, we can take a look at, at, at where that money is coming from. Um, and, and income taxes are really, and, and have been for over a half century, the cornerstone of our revenue system in Georgia. And, and, and one thing that I think is important is to understand that what we're looking at here is the governor's revenue estimate for 2024. And in Georgia, the way that our revenue system is structured is so that has the authority uh, to set it, the, the revenue estimate that caps the amount that the General Assembly, the House and the Senate can then appropriate. So th th this revenue estimate for the last three years um, has been far below the amount that the state has actually collected. Um, and income taxes have really been what has been driving that surplus, both corporate and personal income taxes. Uh, as, as wages increase, as we see inflation, um, rippling through the economy, as well as the effects of heightened federal spending, federal programs that have uh, resulted in more money in the pockets of Georgians across our state, we've seen those income tax numbers surge. So actually last year, the state collected almost $17 billion in personal income taxes, uh, and that was actually down from the year before. You can see here the governor estimates about $14.8 billion for next year, uh, about 14% less than we collected last year, which uh, I think is unlikely, is, is likely, you know, in, a, another area where we see the state estimating very conservatively uh, likely what we're, what we're uh, below what we're likely to collect. Uh, and then the corporate income tax, we see the governor estimating about $1.4 billion for next year, when last year the state collected double that, about 2.8, uh, uh, actually uh, about uh, $3.8 billion in corporate income taxes. Um, so so well, well above what we're estimating for next year. Um, and then the sales tax is about a quarter of the state's uh, revenue uh, model where we have about uh, $8.4 billion estimated for uh, next year, uh, well below what we saw collected last year. And then a mix of other smaller taxes and fees round out the state's revenue system, uh, with several of those dedicated to certain functions of state government. Uh, the motor fuel tax is dedicated to infrastructure, uh, providing for about 18,000 miles of state highway, and also giving grants to cities and counties that are across the state. Uh, lottery, which is designated for uh, the HOPE scholarship, as well as pre-K funding across the state, uh, and then a much smaller pool of tobacco settlement funds um, and, and, and other small uh, fees that go to primarily healthcare. Um, so again, uh, with, with about three, 32, uh, 
$6.4 billion estimated for 2024. That would put us in terms of taxes, what's been reported for last year fully, uh, about 14% below what we collected last year. So uh, again, we see a very conservative revenue estimate here that's likely to produce a surplus uh, for what would be a fourth consecutive year, uh, which is really unprecedented. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, we can see what 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 taxes feel like for Georgians across our state. So actually, um, you know, kind of counterintuitively from uh, what many people might think, those in Georgia who earn the lowest incomes pay the highest share of what they earn, uh, the pay that they take home in state and local taxes. So those Georgians who are making the least, uh, less than $20,000 a year for the most part, are paying about 10% of their income in state and local taxes. And much of that is being felt in sales taxes. Uh, and, and, and you can see as earnings go up, you are statistically uh, likelier to pay a lower share of what you earn in state and local taxes. Um, and, and that is you know, unfortunately, really problematic in terms of continuing to expand what is a historical uh, legacy of huge disparities across income and race um, through systematic uh, systems that, that, that have really caused that disparity um, to, to, to be uh, at, at one of the greatest rates in our nation. Um, so you can see that in Georgia, also those who are uh, Black, African American, Hispanic, and Latino are most likely to be represented at the lowest levels of income. Uh, while disproportionately we see uh, white and Asian Georgians represented at higher rates uh, among those earning the greatest levels. And so unfortunately, what, what that all adds up to is a tax system that is growing those disparities, uh, both in net worth and in annual income. Um, so if we continue on, so Georgia, uh, in, in terms of our budget, uh, the vast majority goes to healthcare and public education. Uh, about 38 cents of every dollar the state spends goes to pre-K through 12th grade education, uh, a, a, about 18% uh, to, to higher education, about 21% to health services, uh, primarily Medicaid and then behavioral health. Uh, about 7% to transportation, 9% to the criminal legal system, and then just a very small share left over, uh, about 4% for other general areas of, of government. So uh, a, a very lean budget and, and primarily healthcare and education uh, is what those state dollars are going towards. Next slide. Okay. Uh, so in, when we add on federal funding, we get to just under $56 billion. And, and, and the majority of that federal funding is going to help pay for the cost of Medicaid uh, and, and, and other health services across the state. So we see uh, a little over $10 billion coming into the state uh, for uh, Medicaid uh, and other health services, about 2.6 billion for K through 12 education, just under 2 billion for higher education, uh, about one and a half billion dollars in transportation funding, and then just over a billion dollars for human services. Um, so federal, so th th those federal funds uh, just add in to what are really essential services. And if we get to the next slide. So now uh, in this section, we'll look at some of the trends that have resulted in an unprecedented surplus and, and a state government that, that is still in many cases uh, taking a mindset of austerity, keeping extremely low staffing levels, uh, high turnover because of really low salaries and overworked employees across state government uh, and, and, and very limited uh, investments being made. So in, in Georgia, our revenue shortfall reserve, the state savings account that we've had, it maintained since the mid-1970s as sort of the way that we hedge against recessions, being able to avoid uh, really deep spending cuts uh, when, when it, during tough economic times, um, that is capped at 15% of state revenues. So since 2021, that account has been full because of those really large surpluses uh, that started with 
uh, that that huge federal investment to help avoid what could have been one of the deepest recessions and generations uh, as a result of COVID. But because of you know, how strongly that response uh, stepped in, we saw a huge rebound that has obviously continued um, into an economy now that has caught up to where uh, it, it otherwise would have been, and in many cases exceeded uh, some of those projections from 2019. So, that is capped at 15%. And if we go to the next slide, we see the effects of uh, a, a state that has continued to set these very conservative revenue estimates uh, without a plan to spend uh, huge amounts of revenue that have come into the state in, in the last three years. So in 2021, the state ran just under a $4 billion surplus. In 2022, the state ran uh, just over a six and a half billion dollar surplus. And last year, uh, the state looks to have run uh, somewhere around a five billion dollar surplus. So the effect of that is over ten billion dollars in what is called unde undesignated surplus. And throughout Georgia's history, uh, prior to 2021, uh, we had never been in that financial position. We had never had more than uh, the the 15% the cap, cap of the revenue shortfall reserve. Um, and today, uh, what we see is aside from really limited rebates uh, that, that, that have kind of, you know, been a drop in the bucket in comparison with, to what the state has generated, uh, very little of that has been allocated. Uh, when we have huge needs that, that, that uh, we're, we're certainly going to hear about, uh, in the other analyst presentations. And, and what we also see is a plan uh, of spending for next year that makes very limited additions, uh, continues to grow below the rate of inflation and population growth, uh, and, and, and does not uh, account for the amount of revenue that we're likely to generate. So uh, with that, uh, I will uh, pass it on. Um, and 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 here we 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 see you know the the the, the tax breaks uh, that, that that are continuing to um, grow in many cases about ten billion dollars cumulatively um, and, and uh, uh, the the largest tax break being the film tax credit and continuing on and 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 the last point that I'll highlight uh, is. You know, in, in addition to maintaining those generally uh, conservative spending levels, what we saw uh, in, in, in the signing of the 2024 budget from uh, the governor is an unprecedented use of both vetoes and what are called budget disregards uh, that primarily have the same effect, meaning that the, the funding that was approved by the General Assembly uh, will not be allocated uh, for the uses uh, in, in many cases approved by. Uh, the General Assembly. So what we see is uh, a, a little bit over $100 million in budget disregards uh, that will affect the Department of Behavioral Health uh, and, and, and the Department of Community Health and Medicaid. Uh, and then about $20 million in disregards to uh, public education uh, and, and, and about $25 million in a cost of living adjustment that would have been made for uh, retired state employees. So uh, again, a really unprecedented use. Uh, you can see that more disregards and vetoes were issued last year uh, than in the entire uh, four preceding years of uh, Governor Kemp's governorship. So, um, and, and, and that is uh, the last slide. And now uh, I will pass it on uh, to our education analyst. Thanks, Danny. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ife Finch Floyd, and I am the Director of Economic Justice at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Um, so I am going to talk about the Department of Early Care and Learning. Next slide. Yep, that's me, the first one. Great. Um, so the uh, FY 2024 budget sends about $506 million to the Department of Early Care and Lo Learning. And DECAL oversees the child care system um, in the state and administers the Georgia pre-K program. 
Um, so the $506 million to decal is about a 10% increase over uh, FY 2023 and about a 15% increase since the passage of the FY 2020 budget, um, which was passed before the start of the pandemic. And as you can see, the pre-K program makes up the vast majority of state spending in decal um, and of course is funded by the Georgia Lottery. It receives about 440, it is receiving about $444 million this year. Um, and child care services is receiving about $63 million. Child care and parent service. Parent Services administers the scholarships or the child care voucher program, the quality rating system, and offers support to licensed child care providers. Next slide. So almost half of the $44 million increase in state funds for DECAL this year went to the $2,000 pay increase um, for uh, decal state, state decal workers and pre-K teachers and assistant teachers. There's another $14 million for pre-K classroom operations so that pre-K programs can redirect some of those resources to increase pay for the teachers. And then there's another $8 million to increase the employer contribution for the state health plan and an additional $1 million to child care services so the state can draw down all available federal resources for child care. Next slide. So sticking with child care, child care is essential for our economy and is a critical part of our early care and learning and developmental system for children, but it does not receive the level of investment it should, given its critical role in supporting workers, families, and children. So for example, state funding for child care services has changed very little in the past decade, despite the growing costs of child care, we keep kind of seeing news reports about that, and, and um, workers leaving the industry for higher wages and better benefits elsewhere. And this started really before the pandemic, but um, we certainly saw um, some of that decline during the pandemic as well. The state meets its contribution to the federal and state match, again, to draw down federal resources, but it doesn't have to stop there. More state support for childcare is urgent. And here's why. The federal relief funding, which helps stabilize our child care system in Georgia, will start to wind down this fall and then will fully expire in 2024 if there isn't congressional action. So there needs to be more federal and state investments to prevent center closures and children losing access to care. Next slide. So in the FY 2024 budget, um, there are important investments in the Georgia Pre-K program. And even with these new investments though, the Georgia Pre-K program lags behind public kindergarten um, in funding per student. So Georgia's pre-K program serves about 84,000 four-year-olds, can serve up to 84,000 four-year-olds um, at about uh, $5,300 per student. Um, and that's the most that has been provided since the inception um, of the program. However, children one grade older um, in public kindergarten are allotted about $7,000 per student in state funds. And that's a difference of, um, of more than $1,700 per child. So if Georgia were to fund the pre-K program at the same rate as kindergarten, the program would need an additional $147 million annually. So one way to think about um, how the state can invest in pre-K or uh, further invest in pre-K um, is looking at the assistant teacher pay. So assistant teachers have some of the lowest pay among early childhood educators. Even with the $2,000 pay bump that we heard about, the base salary for a pre-K assistant teacher is 20, about $20,000, regardless of credentials. And that's about $11.50 an hour for in a 40-hour work week for the school year. Um, we're going to, uh, well, legislators ignored um, available resources to, to close the gap. So um, my colleague Ashley is going to talk a little bit more about this, but Georgia has a $1.9 billion in lottery reserves, and the state requires only about $772 million in case of a shortfall. So there's more than a billion dollars um, that the state could use to invest in childcare. 
So legislators should look to the overage in the lottery reserves to increase pre-K assistant teacher pay and increasing their pay, um, improve staff retention, and of course, classroom quality. I'm going to pass it now to my colleague, Stephen Owens. Thanks, Yvette. I'm Dr. Stephen Owens, the Education Director here at the, the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Just giving you a quick overview of the budget for K through 12 education. As Danny mentioned, the largest line item we have in our budget, that is not rare state uh, nationwide. Uh, and this is thank to, thanks to uh, black lawmakers during reconstruction. Uh, Tunis Campbell is the lawmaker here in Georgia who's probably mostly responsible for the fact that we have a constitutional right to free public education uh, for all children. Um, this first line, uh, $840 million was added in this budget because the state health benefit plan increased premiums uh, for the employers. And as the state pays the employer contribution for teachers and certificated employees, that's an, a significant amount that had to go to public schools to pay for the health insurance. It's important to note, though, then in the wake of the Great Recession, the state stopped paying uh, for the employer portion of health insurance for non-certificated employees. Um, there's about as many employees in the school uh, who are supporting uh, the school and our students as there are certificated. So think uh, custodians, bus drivers, these folks, uh, their insurance also is going to go up. Uh, but the state won't pay that. So it leaves districts to find hundreds of millions of extra dollars uh, to meet this need. And if you will, in a few weeks, we are going to publish a survey of school district leaders that find that they are in some really difficult decisions as a way to find out how to make up that difference uh, that uh, just teasing a report coming out uh, in the next few weeks. Governor Kemp continued kind of his legacy inside education funding, which is to increase teacher pay. It's a $2,000 uh, pay raise, uh, which will take effect September 1st. Um, the state pays about half of all the teachers um, in the state of Georgia, that because state funding um, is just part of your school's budget. It's shared with local and federal funding. Um, so we'll talk in a little bit about how, the, obviously this is good news for schools, um, but it leaves districts to kind of make up the difference to make sure that everyone uh, can have this cost of living adjustment. And you'll notice it takes effect on September 1st, not July 1st, the beginning of the fiscal year. That also puts some pressure on districts to find that, that gap funding until it actually takes effect. $155 million because we have more student in more expensive programs for uh, teaching and experience. This equalization line item, uh, Georgia has a policy lever uh, called the Equalization Grant, which purpose is to, as it says, equalize between uh, districts with a lot of property wealth per student. Think Rabin County, Fayette County, Atlanta Public Schools, uh, and those uh, with not a lot of property wealth per student. I uh, think Clayton County, think Southwest Georgia, Jeff Davis County, a lot of our rural schools. Equalization grant works to somewhat equalize those districts in the bottom 50% of districts um, to the, the state median. Whenever we put in more money into the equalization grant, it means that the gap between our rich district and our poorer or low wealth districts has gotten larger, right? So this shows that the state has to equalize further so that you get an idea of kind of where property tax collection is statewide. Um, we had a $27 million increase to fully fund one school counselor to 450 students, a great addition. Um, but this just gets us into the basement, right? Um, one school counselor to 450 students, that is a huge caseload. The American School Counselors Association recommends one to every 250 students, so there's still a good ways to go there. And then finally, 4.7 million uh, to give raises for people transportation. That I'll talk about a little bit later. As you'll see on the next slide, though, there is a hole in the bathtub, um, which is private school vouchers. This is public funds going to uh, private educational expenses. And for the first year, uh, one of our two vouchers, the Qualified Education Expense Tax Credit, um, was required to report just a little bit more out on where this money is going. Now, this program is $120 million a year. 
um, where you can get a tax, a dollar for dollar tax credit, uh, where those funds go to a, a third party, which then part of those funds go to pay for private education expenses. Um, this is a great program to make money on a tax credit. It is not a great money, uh, great program um, if you want to increase uh, education for the state of Georgia, because we can see what this looks like in other states uh, where the impact of taking a voucher compared to staying in the public school is worse than the learning loss due to COVID-19 in two of the statewide programs that we've looked at. Um, so it has incredible ability to hurt student test scores, um, as well as draining these necessary funds from the public coffers. And when you look at how this money is spent statewide, even though the entire state is subsidizing a program like this, um, it is concentrated in just a few of the more populous counties, but even more so than just a look at population, 31% of all of these debt voucher dollars were spent in just two counties, Fulton and DeKalb. Um, but on the next slide, we're going to bring it back to the safe arms of our public schools to look at uh, teacher salaries as far as how much the state is paying for teacher salaries uh, and the impact due to inflation. Um, so if we use 2010, 15 years ago, as a benchmark and looked at inflation moving on, you can see that while these cost of living raises have been great for teachers, they are not keeping up with the uh, pace of inflation. That last year, for a first year teacher making the base salary, about $7,700 less per year than if their salaries had kept place, pace uh, with inflation. Um, that hurts for a lot of our areas that we know we have shortages in, rural schools, special education, uh, low well school districts or schools serving a lot of students living in poverty. Um, on the next slide, we're going to see how it's even harder for schools to make up that difference for these shortages when not all of their programs uh, are fully funded. For instance, pupil transportation, it is required by law to provide transportation to students to and from the school. You can see the costs going up every year per student but state funding has remained flat. We're actually spending, we actually spent less in 2023 per student um, than we did in 2002. That's when I graduated high school, y'all. Um, schools that have to make up this difference, this hundreds of millions of dollar difference have to pull from somewhere else. Um, and you can create a system of haves and have nots and put students uh, safety in danger it makes for longer routes. It has kids missing breakfast at school in the morning, missing classes school in the morning if we don't fully fund those necessary programs like students' transportation. And on this last slide, I wanna talk about the blind spot in the way that we fund schools, which is Georgia is one of only six states that does not provide any funding to educate students living in poverty. Um, there are actually three bills uh, that would do that, in this next session, House Bill 3, House Bill 668, House Senate Bill 284. We need to join the rest of the nation and provide funding specifically to meet these challenges. And before I pass it on to Ashley, I would not be a good education analyst if I didn't give a shout out to the tireless folks working in schools who just started school, maybe including my kids' teachers, uh, Ms. Param Ifololo, Ms. Gale, Ms. Scott, Mr. Jordan, their bus driver, Mr. Coleman, and I won't end on that shout out. I'll pass it in a shout out to Ashley Young, education analyst in charge of higher education. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, again, I am Ashley Young, higher education analyst, and greetings to all of our attendees. Um, so what you see here, uh, the University System of Georgia, I'll start here with the $66 million budget cut. Um, this was across all 26 institutions in the University System of Georgia. As you can imagine, this is a major setback for higher education in Georgia, especially after 2019 when the university system um, is still reeling from a 10% budget cut due to COVID-19 in 2021, which unfortunately has never been restored. 
um, to paint a more comprehensive picture for you all. The 2024 budget for the University System of Georgia is $3.1 billion. And majority of this budget, um, 2.9 billion, is allocated to student instruction, support services, and basic college operations. Again, the most impactful budget implication is the $66 million reduction in the teaching program state funds for fiscal year 2024. And this is due to the decreased enrollment at not all institutions, but about 20 institutions have experienced decreased enrollment. So a good number of schools in our university system of Georgia, have uh, the enrollment has actually gone down. Uh, the reduction is distributed across 26, um, all 26 institutions to minimize the disproportionate impact on students and operations. What I also think is important to highlight in this conversation regarding the very important um, topic of college affordability is college tuition. So you may have already heard, but in Georgia, tuition rates have remained flat uh, for this upcoming year. Um, and sadly, colleges will have to find appropriate ways um, to serve students at a high level while navigating um, this, de this de uh, devastating excuse me, reality of the $66 million budget cut. I want to be clear, not raising tuition, of course, is a good thing for our students and making college more affordable, but with coupled with the $66 million budget budget cut, it is going to put some pressure on colleges to figure out how to make ends meet. To provide a little bit more perspective on this, Georgia is ranked number seven in the U.S. for the lowest tuition rate for public colleges at an average of about $8,556, according to the College Board, while the national average for public college tuition is $11,055. Next slide, please. If you had an opportunity to attend our annual conference, Insights, back in January, I spoke a little bit about this disinvestment in public higher education in Georgia. What you're looking at here is actually directly from Chancellor Purdue's presentation, um, and you see in this graphic a sharp decrease in public funds for the university system of Georgia. Um, again, Chancellor Purdue chair, uh, shared this information at the beginning of our legislative session um, regarding uh, the, the system's funding formula trend. A few highlights that I want to point out to you here. Um, you will notice the dip in 2021, again, due to COVID-19 um, pandemic in 20, um, excuse me, in 2021. And uh, from the highest investment that we see on this graphic um, at the year 2001, um, which it was 75%. So now, which is 57%. Um, that is a total of an 18% decrease in funding for public colleges since that time. Uh, but despite that $66 million cut, um, fiscal year uh, 2024, University System of Georgia did see an increase of about 2.1% in state general funds. Okay, next slide, please. Now for the Technical College System of Georgia, TCSG. Um, it includes actually 22 colleges across the state. Um, and in our fiscal year um, budget, there is about $444 million. Of that $444 million, about $383 million is allocated to technical education, which I will um, cover um, in just a moment. So about $2,000 of cost of living increases for full-time eligible employees, $9 million reductions in funds due to decreased enrollment. Um, and this has a lot to do, unfortunately, with the impact of the pandemic. Um, but there was an $8 million increase allocated for high demand, high cost careers, such as aviation, um, commercial driver's license, and nursing programs. What I am excited to share today is that despite this decreased enrollment during the pandemic's height, TCSG did see a 2.3% enrollment increase from, 20, uh, from the year 2021 to 2022. This increase was reflected in both credit hour completion and full-time equivalent um, student enrollment. So what you see here in this illustration um, uh, with the enrollment and the funding per student and 
the Technical College System of Georgia. Um, the funding has picked up drastically since the start drop in 2011. It has though remained mostly flat at around $6,456 for fiscal year 2023. And while we do not have uh, fiscal year 2024 enrollment data currently, in our estimation analysis based on the trend of the recent years, TCSG will more than likely remain flat around 58,000 students. All right, and for my last slide here, um, as uh, Ife Finch spoke a little bit more about early, I, earlier, I am going to uh, talk a little bit more about what is very urgent um, and one of our top priorities here at Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, and that is to utilize the education lottery um, in an equitable way. So this graphic is an illustration of the lottery's unrestricted reserves and the required lottery reserves since 2008. As you can see, the unrestricted reserves are outpacing the hope shortfall by millions of dollars each year, and this gap continues to widen as the years progress. Uh, since 2011, the state law has required the lottery shortfall to hold an amount equal to 50% of the previous year's net lottery proceeds. Um, if lottery tickets do underperform, of course, the state can draw from this reserve to fund the hope scholarship. At the end of FY 2022, the record short shortfall balance was $772 million, and the state exceeded that balance by more than $1 billion. To be exact, there's around $1.1 billion in unrestricted dollars in the education lottery reserve. I just want to end here and say that um, the education lottery reserve has $1.9 billion. That, that's B billion with a B, right? And these figures are very critical for multiple reasons, but the main points I really wanna highlight are Georgia is ranked number three in the nation for student loan debt per, per borrower at $41,639. So the status quo is not working or it's not working very effectively. 48% of the undergraduate students in Georgia are Pell eligible. So that says that we need to help support our students. Um, although college completion grants, a new policy has been in place to help bridge the gap for students who have exhausted financial options. Uh, the truth is, this is only a $10 million budget for all university system of Georgia, TCSG, and private colleges. This is a step in the right direction, but there's much improvement that can be made. Finally, Georgia is a state where Merit-based reigns, merit-based scholarship, excuse me, reign supreme. As evidence, Georgia is only one of two states that does not offer finance, uh, need-based financial aid. I believe a solution to this can be found in our education lottery reserve. With the resources, um, higher education advocates, we believe um, that using our education lottery reserve to fund a need-based aid program is about equity, access, and fairness. Um, it's justice for those who have been historically excluded from building wealth. To sum up my vehement thoughts on this matter, I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes by poet Amanda Gorman. It says, it is being an American, um, it is because being an American, excuse me, is more than the pride win here, but the paths, how we step into that and how we repair it. Um, so I will now turn it over to Leah Chan, our senior health policy analyst. Thanks so much. Um, next slide. Great, so in the budget primer, we cover the state's three primary health agencies. It's a lot of information and some of it we won't have time to cover today. So I really encourage you all to read the full primer on our website or order one um, with the link in the chat if you want a deeper dive on different health topics. So the departments of behavioral health and developmental disabilities, community health and public health are the three primary agencies focused on our state's healthcare and public health systems. Georgia plans to provide 6.7 billion in state funds for these three agencies in the fiscal year 2024 budget. This accounts for about 21% of overall state spending. You can also see from this slide the proportion of state health spending that goes to each agency. So Department of Community Health administers our state's Medicaid and Peach Care program, which provides health care to folks with lower incomes. 
And as you can see, the Department of Community Health accounts for the majority, about 71% of state health spending. Another 22% goes towards Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, which operates state hospitals and provides community-based services to Georgians living with mental health conditions, substance use disorders, or developmental disabilities. And finally, a mere 6% of our state health spending goes toward Department of Public Health, which operates programs focused on disease and injury prevention, health promotion, and health-related disaster response and preparedness. Next slide. So as Danny mentioned, in May 2023, the governor issued guidance directing state agencies to disregard some budget language. In total, the governor is directing state health agencies to disregard about 104 million in funding, along with seven additional uh, budget actions with no associated funding. These disregards are a small proportion of each department's budget, but represent significant changes to address pressing needs. As just one example, about 17 million in DBHDD funding for various purposes has been entirely disregarded from increasing salaries for state psychiatric hospital nurses and health aides to supporting the 988 suicide crisis, uh, uh, suicide and crisis lifeline. Next slide. So at the same time that the governor is pulling back front funds to help fill critical positions, the state health agencies are grappling with workforce recruitment and retention issues. So turnover rates for the state health agencies have increased since 2016 ranging from about 20% um, turnover at DPH to about 35% at DBHDD. And all, although the demands on these state health agencies have only increased over time, their staffing levels have decreased. Um, for example, DCH has seen a decrease in staff from 2016 to 2022, from a high of about 940 full-time staff to a low of about 640. So the amended fiscal year 2023 budget included $5,000 cost of living increases, as well as salary increases for select job categories at both DBHD and DPH. Full-time staff at all three agencies will receive an additional $2,000 cost of living increase as part of the fiscal year 2024 budget. And these cost of living increases help employees manage rising prices for basic staples like housing and food, but they don't necessarily add up to more dollars in their pocket. So continued efforts are likely going to be needed to ensure that our state health agencies are fully staffed with a trained, diverse, stable workforce that's ready to meet Georgia's ever-shifting health needs. Next slide. So I'd like to switch gears now and talk specifically about state spending on Medicaid and peach care. So unequal access to affordable, high-quality health care continues to impact Georgians. Our state ranks third nationally in the number of uninsured people. And our rates of uninsurance are partly due to our state's decision to not fully expand Medicaid, a decision that really reflects our state's history of oppression and an imbalanced power structure. So while more than one in eight Georgians does not have health care coverage, the burden is heaviest on Georgians living in rural communities and Georgians of color, particularly Latinx Georgians. Next slide. So Medicaid and peach care serve about 3 million folks, um, which uh, comes out to about one in four residents in Georgia. The low income Medicaid program serves children, pregnant women, um, pregnant and postpartum people, and some parents with very low incomes. The age blind and disabled portion of the program serves older adults and people with physical and developmental disabilities. And then Peach Care is a separate program serving children from families with incomes above the Medicaid threshold, but who often lack access to other forms of coverage. So Georgia expects to spend about $4.4 billion in state funds to serve Georgians who are covered by Medicaid or Peach Care. Children make up about 69% of all those enrolled under the low-income Medicaid and Peach Care program categories, but most of the spending goes towards health care for older adults and individuals living with disabilities. So one particularly bright spot in this year's Medicaid budget is the removal of the five-year waiting period um, for Medicaid-eligible pregnant women and children who are lawful permanent residents. Thanks to this small investment of about $580,000 in state spending, um, new Georgians will be able to see the doctor, refill prescriptions, get access to preventive care, and so much more during that, those pivotal pregnancy, postpartum, and childhood years. Next slide. 
So there are two changes in our Medicaid program that will significantly impact people's ability to access care and impact our state bottoms line, the state's bottom line. The first is Medicaid unwinding. So thanks to a pandemic era federal policy, millions of Georgians have had uninterrupted access to affordable health care over the past three years. Starting in April 2023, that continuous Medicaid and peach care coverage began to unwind, and every child and adult enrolled in Georgia's healthcare safety net will have their eligibility redetermined prior to the end of May 2024. This unprecedented healthcare event puts pressure on our state agencies and really jeopardizes the health and financial security of Georgians with lower incomes. Between 172,000 and 545,000 Georgians are estimated to lose coverage over the course of this unwinding. Inequitable access to economic opportunity for Georgians of color means low-income Black and Latinx Georgians are less likely than white adults to have access to employer-sponsored health care coverage, and their families are overrepresented in Georgia's Medicaid and peach care system. As a result, families of color, particularly Black and Latinx children, are likely to see disproportionate losses of coverage during the unwinding. Next slide. So with only two months of disenrollment data on hand, we see that already almost 100,000 Georgians have lost coverage. More than 90% of those who lost coverage have lost it for procedural reasons, which means they are still eligible, but are denied coverage due to a human or technological error in the process, like the form being sent to the wrong address. We also know that a majority of those getting caught in this paperwork trap are children and their families. So in June alone, over 63,000 children from babies to teens lost access to healthcare coverage. So as school opened up across Georgia this week, there were students arriving in classrooms who will no longer have access to insulin they need to manage their diabetes, students who will no longer have access to mental health treatment that they need, and parents who have now have a new medical debt that they cannot pay because they didn't realize they lost coverage until they ended up in the ER with a sick kid. And as we grapple with hospitals at risk of closure, this unwinding also means more people showing up needing uncompensated care. Next slide. So the Medicaid unwinding will not only reverberate across homes and classrooms and health systems, it will also impact our state's bottom line. So since the start of the pandemic area continuous um, eligibility policy, the federal government has provided every state with additional federal funding to keep folks on the Medicaid rolls. We know that this enhanced federal match brought fiscal relief to our state and more than offset the state cost of Medicaid coverage for the Georgians that got added during the pandemic. The federal government started stair-stepping down the enhanced match in April, and we will go back to our standard match rate in January 2024. However, we also know that the unnecessary procedural denials happening now are a drain on our state's resources. When eligible Georgians lose coverage, particularly children, they are likely to re-enroll in three, six, nine months a year. And research has shown us that churning off and on of Medicaid creates higher administrative costs and unpredictable state expenditures. So the state needs to work now to prevent those procedural denials in order to save money and staff time in the future. Next slide. So in July, the state also rolled out Governor Kemp's um, signature healthcare program called Pathways to Coverage. This program expands healthcare coverage for low-income adults who are currently in the coverage gap, meaning they earn too much to qualify for traditional Medicaid coverage, but not enough to qualify for subsidized coverage in the health insurance marketplace. This program does not impose new requirements on Georgians already covered under traditional Medicaid eligibility. It expands coverage to Georgians 19 to 64 who have a household income of up to 100% of the federal poverty level. To be eligible, however, enrollees must complete and report on a monthly basis a minimum of 80 hours per month of qualifying activities like employment, community service, or higher education. Next slide. So the total state funds allotted for the Pathways to Coverage program will allow the state to enroll about 47,500 Georgians, which is far fewer than the 345,000 Georgians that the governor said are qualified for the program in his 2023 State of the State address. By contrast, if the state expands Medicaid eligibility to low-income adults with ar without arbitrary restrictions or burdensome reporting requirements, the state could cover almost half a million Georgians at a much lower cost. Next slide. 
No matter how many people gain access to healthcare through the Pathways to Coverage program, it will simply cover fewer Georgians and cost substantially more for the state to implement than a fully expanded Medicaid program. So I will pass it over now to my colleague, Ife Finch Floyd. Thanks, Leah. All right, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. It's me again. I am going to um, talk a little bit about um, human services. Next slide. So the Department of Human Services, um, the FY 2024 budget um, includes $985 million. That's about a 7% increase since last year, FY 2023, and a 19% increase since the passage of the 2020 budget, uh, both, again, before the pandemic. So child welfare, foster care, adoption services, um, those all account for about 63% of the agency's budget. And then the next biggest share is the administration of low-income programs like Medicaid, uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP or food stamps, and Temporary Assistance for Needy Families or TANF. That's about 16% of the agency's budget. Next slide. So some of the increase, the $65 million increase includes uh, $15.4 million for the pay increase for state employees. Um, and then $11.1 .1 million to hire 450 additional Medicaid uh, eligibility caseworkers and 75 supervisors. And this is to support the Medicaid unwinding process. But I want you guys to keep those numbers in mind because we're going to come back to them. There's also, also some additional funding um, for foster care, $15.2 million to supplement state fund um, to, for excuse me, to supplement the loss of federal funds um, to, um, to group homes. Um, and then another $5 million, some people may be aware of this around the hoteling issues, we heard it in the news and throughout the legislative session. Um, so to provide those alternative housing and services for foster care youth with complex needs. However, I did want to elevate um, one other piece. The governor directed the vocational rehab agency um, to disregard more than $400,000 in um, initiatives like the Georgia Reading Service for the Blind, Independent Living Services, and Employment Services for transplant, transplant recipients. Next slide. So I'm going to focus the remainder of my remarks on probably the biggest issue that's impacting the Department of Human Services and the sub-agency um, Division of Family and Children's Services, um, and that is staffing. And DFACS, the Division of Family and Children's Services, has lost about 16% of its total workforce since 2017. And much of the loss of DFACS uh, casework, uh, excuse me, DFACS workers is among that frontline staff. So the frontline staff in child welfare and the frontline staff who work in the Office of Family Independence, which is ministers those low-income programs that I mentioned um, at the top of my remarks. Next slide. So I'm not gonna go through everything on this slide, <laughs> um, but, I wanted to show this because the caseload matters when you think about the administration, excuse me, the caseload, the workforce, <laughs> the declining workforce matters when you think about the administrative burden that defects specifically and specifically the Office of Family um, Independence is under. Um, Leah already mentioned Medicaid unwinding and pathways to coverage. Um, but the transition to a state-based marketplace for health insurance, um, DFACS is going to play a role in there. Um, you may have seen news reports about the backlog of SNAP renewals. So last November, the agency was behind on renewals. They got approval from the feds to push that back um, to the spring. Um, but now that just created more backlog and tens of thousands of households have have been um, waiting or have had delayed payments and SNAP payments. DFACS is working overtime to address this. There's also the return, a, a SNAP unwinding. We have Medicaid unwinding. Well, there's a SNAP unwinding. It's, it's much smaller, hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but it's the return of the time limit and work requirements for certain adults. And that's going to take a lot of staff time um, because the, um, the state did not um, uh, implement some uh, flexibilities that would have helped staff with, with that administrative work. 
And then the debt ceiling actually added changes um, to SNAP and this the, the department's going to have to uh, stand all that up. Next slide, please. So when you think about everything that this agency and this one office is handling, it is overwhelming. But if you think about the investment, it just doesn't match what the state has to do to, in order to meet all of these needs. The hiring and training of 450 new staff is important, right? But that's gonna take several months before they can effectively help alleviate the workload. The $2,000 pay increase is important, but when you consider, like in this graph, what that means related to inflation, it just doesn't get you that far, right? Um, so there's a real concern about staff retention, and we elevated this in the last um, legislative session in hopes for more investment there. Legislators really need to think critically about what retention can look like, and that is investments that bolsters professional development, creates benefits like paid med family medical leave, sets competitive starting salaries, and improves the system of merit-based uh, raises. Technology is helpful, but it cannot do everything that staffing can do. So next year's budget is another opportunity to consider some of these options. And really, it, these investments aren't gonna rest with the agency, right? They will improve service delivery, which ultimately will help all Georgians. So I'll pause there and turn it over to my colleague, Ray, to bring us home. Yes, yes. Greetings, everyone. I'm, I'm Ray Calfani, Senior Analyst at GBPI. And I'll be, I'll be highlighting two areas that outline Georgia lawmakers' moral choices, two, two additional areas that outline Georgia lawmakers' moral choices in the state budget. And that's the Georgia Department of Labor and the Georgia Department of Corrections, as well as discussing their equity implications. So, you know, the Georgia Department of Labor, you know, serves as a state as a state agency administering a critical social insurance system that provides a protective floor for involuntarily jobless Georgians and helps to maintain economic stability. It's played an invaluable role in Georgia's economic recovery, processing millions of UI claims over the last few years that allow Georgians who are dislocated from their jobs to maintain financial stability while they searched and trained for suitable jobs. It helped to maintain consumer spending that kept businesses running. And the Georgia Department of Labor played a role in generating tax revenue to help fund state and local public services. So you know, all of these functions you know, help Georgia's economy broadly recover more quickly than what it would have without that. And particularly during the period when UI benefits were expanded, uh, it prevented more Georgia workers from getting trapped in low quality jobs that depress their lifetime earnings. So today's presentation or conversation rather uh, around the Department of Labor will highlight not only how the state spends you know, investments you know, from general public you know, tax money to administer Department of Labor programs, uh, but also how the state gathers investments from employers to fund UI benefits and supplement funding for Department of Labor program administration. Uh, now, you know, if we compare, you know, the, the latest fiscal year 2024 Department of Labor budget with, with the last fiscal year 2023, you know, we find spending increases that made, uh, you know, continued efforts to, to maintain and boost staff levels. And, I, and we'll go to the next slide. Um, you know, and, and this includes, you know, increased spending to cover another year of cost of living increases. Also, you know, increases were made to, to cover Department of Labor staff salaries that are no longer paid. Uh, by Wagner Pizer funding. When I say Wagner Pizer, I mean th these are dollars, you know, to fund workforce development programs uh, that were transferred to the Georgia's the, Georgia's uh, technical college system in the last fiscal year of 2023. So all in all, you know, the pay increases that took place, um, you know, they account they accounted for nearly all of the 33% boost in the Department of Labor's total total budget from fiscal year 2023 to 2024. And we can go into the next slide to talk about, you know, like what these state spending priorities mean. So, you know, with the increased spending that's there, you know, there'll be more pay increases, as I mentioned, that, that help Department of Labor staff keep pace with inflation and hopefully help the, help, the, help the agency to retain and attract more staff. But all in all, much like the previous fiscal year, there are no added investments that are that are being made, you know, beyond staff pay increases, meaning nothing will go towards, you know, needed UI program modernization. When I say UI, I'm talking about unemployment insurance, uh, and, you know, and nothing's going to that, you know, despite the Department of Labor failing to meet a number of federal performance standards, you know, for claims processing, overpayment, and underpayment protection, you know, which occurred during the height of the pandemic recession and occurred years afterwards. 
So, you know, this means they continue in adequate access to UI, you know, particularly when, you know, and this is, gonna, this, is, this is what this means, you know, particularly when compared to several other states that have taken more meaningful steps to modernize their UI programs. You know, and this current spending with the Department of Labor, these current spending choices also demonstrate that no state investments will be applied to help implement Georgia's work sharing program. When I say Georgia, when I say work sharing, you know, this is a program that Georgia lawmakers authorized a couple of years ago, but did not fund. Uh, which could which could which could provide employers with uh, a, a UI program alternative to layoffs, and you know particularly as Georgia employers right now seek to avoid layoffs, even as the job market slows down, um, you know to try to maintain worker talent that's hard to find. So we can go to the next slide, and I'll say I, I, I want to be clear. You know when, when we look at uh, just you know the the unemployment insurance initial claims you know trends that have taken place over the last you know several years and what they look like now they're still nowhere where they were um, you know during the height of the recession so I, but with, with everything I just mentioned around you know Department of Labor spending I want to be clear in saying that you know infrastructure and modernization issues that impact Georgia's unemployment insurance system you know they could be significantly attributed to the underfunding at the federal level but. Georgia policymakers have a responsibility to make equitable choices to maintain dedicated revenue sources, you know, that, that can maintain the efficiency of our UI system through the ebbs and flows of federal funding. And, and now I'm going to transition to revenue language um, with the Department of Labor as far as how they gather revenue. So in, in that, you know, and, and being that this is just as important as the spending we do on the programs that they, that they administer, I'll say that, you know, starting, you know, January of this year and, and, and going up until, you know, at least early next year, the Georgia Department of Labor is going to be operating without a steady flow of what's known as um, administrative assessment revenue, which has provided supplemental revenue from employers to help fund the Department of Labor's administrative costs. Now, Georgia lawmakers delayed the flow of this administrative assessment revenue in the 2022 legislative session because of rising concerns that, that, that its renewal is being pegged to the suppression of a separate revenue flow that goes into Georgia, that goes into Georgia's unemployment insurance trust fund. And this is the fund which supplies unemployment insurance benefits to involuntarily unemployed workers and protects them and the broader economy from the deepest harms of recessions. Now, Georgia lawmakers proceeded, you know, to renew the flow of this administrative assessment revenue in this past year's, you know, 2023 legislative session by again tying it to the suppression of unemployment insurance trust fund revenue. And all this is going to, you know, continue into 2024. Um, into this, well, this is going to continue starting, continue starting in, in January 2024, excuse me, meaning that Georgia will continue on an irresponsible path of unpreparedness for future recessions. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, unemployment benefits are paid out of the trust fund, and that's paid by contributions that employers provide, but Georgia workers are going to bear the consequences of this inadequate UI financing approach. Um, you know, as this means that, you know, Georgia is going to likely restrict, you continue, not start, but continue to restrict UI benefit access for workers to compensate for fewer revenues into its trust fund as a means of keeping its trust fund solvent. And furthermore, this is going to fall uh, squarely on the most economically, economically, economically disadvantaged workers, which are disproportionately, you know, affecting communities of color. Then who are going to bear the brunt of job bleeding when, when the economy slows down. So I'm going to change course and jump right into the Georgia Department of Corrections. We can we can go to the next slide and we can go to the one even, even after that. And, and I'll just start by saying that while Georgia policymakers have yet to you know, invest in unemployment insurance system modernizations to help protect workers and to support career mobility, they have prioritized upping investments in Georgia's largest workforce de-attachment system, and that's mass incarceration. So, you know, going into the numbers, you know, on this, and there's so many that you see on this slide, you know, if we compare, you know, the latest fiscal year 2024 Department of Corrections budget with that of the last fiscal year, you know, this year continues that practice of significantly upping investments to Georgia's criminal legal system. And, you know, while, you know, lawmakers may have broken away from this a number of years ago, we're, as far as, you know, upping, you know, mass incarceration investment, we're right back to, to what we've been, you know, what we've been in before, particularly over the last two years. Um, and, and, you know, mass incarceration and, and more prison spending has just followed suit with that. So 
when thinking about this, you know, when combining the spending increases that have taken place just over the last two fiscal years, including amendments to budget spending, uh, Georgia lawmakers have added over $700 million in new mass incarceration spending since fiscal year 2022. And this includes, you know, spending to cover infrastructure upgrades, new prison facilities, new divisions within the Georgia Department of Corrections, including what's known as county correctional institutions, which will do nothing but just further incentivize counties to, to rely on incarceration for more revenue. You know, these, these, this added spending includes more for health spending and also staff pay and benefits. We can go to the next slide. Now, you know, for all this, for all the aforementioned spending that I just mentioned around expanding incarceration, none of that funding reduces the added financial burdens that come to incarcerated Georgians, including the majority share of incarcerated Georgians that are subjected to slavery, meaning that they are forced to supply the state's public and private sectors with labor for zero pay, yet they have to pay for basic necessities while housed in state prisons. So let's just go back into the numbers and is that'll tell is that will tell us, you know, who's paying, you know, who, who's paying for this. Now, a $5.9 million cut in the budget was done during the pandemic cuts during fiscal year 2021. And that was achieved by increasing commissary prices for people who are incarcerated. And this is still maintained in fiscal year 2024's budget, meaning that despite all the state funding that I just mentioned, you know, that's been added to the Georgia Department of Corrections budget, the rising financial burdens to access basic necessities like hygiene products continue to be placed on incarcerated Georgians who disproportionately are Black and Latinx. And, and because they are unpaid prison workers, those costs are being passed on to their loved ones, you know, and their loved ones on the outside, you know, who, who suffered under the weight of a pandemic, uh, who then, on a, then you know, suffered under an uneven recovery, and then under unprecedented inflation, and now, under a job market slowdown that disaggregated data, even from the Department of Labor shows, has quickly eroded last year's employment gains for Black workers, for Black, for Black Georgians. So closing out, you know, just speaking briefly on, you know, and I, we'll go to the next slide, um, and just speaking briefly over on, on prison populations, prison population trends over time. I'm sure many of you know that Georgia passed a number of criminal legal system uh, reform measures that went into effect in 2012 and brought a steady decline in the population. Uh, up until 2014, but they failed to address the broader issue of carceral control, which not only includes those who are incarcerated, but those who are on probation, parole, you know, many of whom still face insurmountable barriers to, to uh, reintegration into society, uh, avoiding recidivism, and returning to the workforce. And, and while workforce reentry issues are not directly overseen by the Georgia Department of Corrections, their Georgia's priorities for addressing crime, which we hear so, so much about, you know, these priorities just, you know, they, they appear just prim primarily, to, they, well, they don't appear, they are, you know, primarily directed towards increasing mass incarceration. And, you know, Georgia must be, you know, and Georgia policymakers must be reoriented to invest in methods of decarceration, such as taking the lead on reducing over-reliance on fines and fees in our state, which often force incarcerated Georgians back into the, back, which also force formerly incarcerated Georgians and even those who haven't been incarcerated forces them into incarceration, and, and you know, and so so fines and fees ultimately worsen prison population growth and capacity issues that the Georgia Department of Corrections must accept the mission to solve. So I, I will stop there. I'll pass it over to my colleague Crystal. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ray, and thank you to all the analysts for such an in-depth look at how our state budget has and will impact everyday Georgians. And now we're, we turn it to the audience. You just heard how our budget works, continued staffing issues throughout Georgia state government, budget cuts to higher education, and the shortfalls of public uh, benefits. So if you have a question about any of the topics we covered here today, please feel free to use the chat. Um, and let me see if we have any questions ready. Okay. Um, can you explain how disregards are legal? Thanks, Crystal. So we put uh, some of this in the chat, but uh, 
the the governor in Georgia obviously has in the constitution the ability to line item veto. So that is is where you strike and 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 then that is completely removed. But the governor also has under the law the ability to say uh I'm going to withhold uh funds from XYZ state agency um, under the authority of the revenue estimate and the ability to cap the amount of state spending. Uh, so there is just extremely wide latitude um, that exists in, in, in the executive office that makes it possible um, to withhold those allocations um, throughout the fiscal year um, un, un, until at least the amended um, budget when, when, when lawmakers come back in January. Um, and, and again, the, the year ends on June 30th. Um, so that is, um, you know, those disregards can be responded to um, by the General Assembly, um, but but that is um, that, 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 that that's how it's able to happen. Okay, and um, going back to the employee or the workforce decrease. This question can either go to Ife or Leah. How does the turnover and the decrease in workforce within DFACS impact the implementation of major initiatives like the Medicaid unwinding and the Pathways to Coverage program? So I can start and Leah, please uh, chime in. Um, so I think when we're thinking about um, staffing levels, right, um, you have to think of kind of um, them as the front lines of kind of responding to clients' needs, um, assessing cases and determining if someone is eligible. And if someone has a question, right, about their case and about their eligibility, the caseworkers are supposed to handle all of that, right? But right now, uh, caseloads for case for, for, for these eligibility workers are in the thousands. I mean, things you can't even imagine, right? So there's no way to be able to respond to all of the inquiries that you might get um, in a timely manner, even though there's an expectation of that. Um, there could be, um, even though there is technology um, kind of like uh, these bots and, and some automation that is certainly is helping. Um, if it's certainly helping for, for those who, um, you know, they can pull information from, you know, different state sources, right? But if that information is not there, it has to be done by a person. And when there are, you know, just a higher level of cases to consider than normal, there is just, there, there's human error and that is unintentional, um, right? But that could mean because of that, be, because, uh, you know, again, if, if human error or missing something um, or, or inputting data in the wrong way, that could lead to an unintentional, right? Loss of coverage for that person, right? Um, and the same kind of, again, when we're thinking about on the SNAP side of things, um, you know, there was a backlog of doing these renewals. So we do renewals every six months, which um, we don't have to, uh, but Georgia decides to, um, but not being able to get those renewals done on time because of, again, the overwhelming number of renewals that are there and considering the, the the, the cases who are as the caseworkers who have to do SNAP and Medicaid and other programs, right? They simply just can't get through them in the in the way um, in the, in the timely manner that that um, you know Jordan's receiving these benefits need. Um, so it is just kind of an overload of of work that anybody right would struggle with. This is not an indictment at all on the individual workers. I think it is a critique of the system and the underinvestment in the system that we've had going on for several years now. Leah, I don't know if there's anything more you want to say to that. That was perfect. Thank you, Ethan. Um. 
Okay. And Ashley Young, um, you mentioned about uh, college completion grants and about how there was no more funding allocated towards that. I was just wondering, um, do you know, have an idea of which students were impacted and what that extra funding would have meant to their college education? Um, let me, sorry, let me be clear that I understand the question, what students were impacted is what you're asking, is what the question is, Crystal? Yeah, like, I guess maybe like the demographic or the type of student. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, um, we're actually in the process of collecting some new data to learn a little bit more about college completion grants um, here in Georgia. Uh, so what we do know is any student who has completed at least 80% um, of their uh, credential uh, towards graduation, 80% um, towards the completion of that credential, excuse me, um, will be eligible for uh, college completion grant. So if you are at 60% or 20%, unfortunately, you would not be eligible. Um, if there's still financial aid that is left to be uh, used, um, you are not going to be eligible. So Students must um, also make sure that they have used any other or exhausted rather any other loans or grants um, that they have um, at their disposal first, and then they can use the college completion grant. So there are no other um, stipulations. You just have to be, again, at any um college in Georgia, so that's private technical college system or university system of Georgia, excuse me, and then 80% completed towards graduation, um, and uh, you have to exhaust all of your other financial aid as well. Thank you for that, Ashley, and thank you very much to all of our speakers today and for all the insight that was shared. And of course, we're so grateful to you um, for being a part of this conversation with us here today. And as a reminder, we will be sending out the follow-up email with the recording of today's town hall along with, feed with a feedback survey. If you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to GBPI. And remember, an investment in GBPI is an investment in Georgia. And with that, I'll bring this meeting to a close. Enjoy your evening.